Whitfield. There he is. Yeah. And uh, well, we got to get down to business, and we're already late behind time because we weren't in there some of us. And uh, first, uh, I'd like to just tell you about Judge Ginsburg and what I need from all of you. Last year at the judge's confirmation hearing to sit on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, one senator paid tribute not only to his insightful mind, but to his sense of compassion and understanding of the law. He went on to say, I have found him, and I know that other members of the Judiciary Committee and the Congress have found him to be open-minded, to be willing to listen, to be willing to consider views which he has not himself held. I think we're fortunate to have this nominee for this extremely important position. Those words are virtually immortal. They were spoken by Senator Ted Kennedy. <laughs> Last week after I announced my intention to nominate Judge Ginsburg, Kennedy's, that same Senator Kennedy said, what is most ominous about the nomination at this stage is the suggestion that Ed Meese prevailed upon the President to name an ideological clone to Judge Bork, a Judge Bork without a paper trail instead of a real conservative who would have broad support in the Senate. This troubling implication is supported by the fact that Judge Ginsburg is one of the least experienced nominees ever submitted by any president to the Supreme Court. If Judge Ginsburg's philosophy about the constitutional rights and liberties of the American people is as extreme as Judge Gorsuch, I'll do all I can to see that this nomination is not confirmed. Consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the senator knows that there have been several appointments to the Supreme Court who never served a day as a judge until they sat on that court. Well, I don't have to tell you any more. Several have been quite a few. Sums up the battle for me. First of all, Doug Ginsburg is my choice. Howard and Ed and I were in agreement on this. Need each and every one of you in every possible form to find opportunities to counter the partisan political obstacles that the Democrats will throw at us. You will be given materials to add to your speeches, and you will be asked to do op ed pieces, 
and look for television and radio opportunities. I'm not looking to begin or permit a repetition of the campaign of pressure politics that recently chilled the judicial selection process. But the print news doesn't carry our side of the story, and the managers of the congressional clock crop put our witnesses on at the end of the day. One way to beat them is to take every opportunity available for us to speak personally to the people here and, and around the country. And I know that Howard and Ken and Nancy and A.B. and others will work closely with you on all of this. So Howard, why don't you, while you're eating, you can talk with your mouth full. <laughs> why don't you tell us about how the calls are going on the Hill? Now, Mr. President, I think the best way. Oh, that's yeah. the Frost yeah. thing, yeah. yeah. For that yeah. TV interview. Oh, yeah. oh, there are. How you doing? Yeah. You look wonderful. You do. Oh, I feel you good. Look wonderful. Good. 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 Nancy. Uh, just fine. Good. good. Uh, the last one. The, the health thing. Good Lord. From the day after the operation, she, the doctor said it was recovering ahead of schedule. I walked her up and down the corridors. Then Barry did. But this last was her yeah. relationship with her mother was really. She just worshipped her. Uh, that's so oh, and Even though, you know, recently your mother hasn't even known us. Yeah. Or anything, but, uh, but it's uh, still. But then, then also, it's she never just quietly went to sleep. And it was it. But, mm -hmm. boy, it was. A, it's it's mm -hmm. always, there's no easy way. There really isn't. But she didn't suffer anything. Then. Mm -hmm. I mean, she just went right on the Yeah. Matter of fact, an old friend, Tom Chauncey, was there and uh, taken her hand, and she was. She went off a lot of sleeping. Yeah. And she just opened her eyes once, he said, Daddy, and just closed her eyes for a few minutes. Not great. Yeah. Well, we were worried about the trip. Mm -hmm. For Mrs. Reagan, we were worried about her having to make that trip so soon afterwards. But uh, you took a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, right. well thank, thank, thank you for having going ahead of us. office in January 1981. Things were not going too well and I had a long list of changes that I wanted. I knew that to get these changes I'd have to have a strong team around me, particularly a strong cabinet that I could rely on. That's why I asked you to serve. Now, first as the United States Trade Representative and then as the Secretary of Labor. And you're one of the wisest choices I made. Looking back, you've carried the ball on some very important initiatives. And the nice thing about it is that uh, you accomplished them in such a quiet and persuasive manner that it left the opponents of progress muttering to themselves. <laughs> <laughs> you helped steer, uh, steer the Caribbean Basin Initiative and the Trade Act of 1984 through the Congress. You took the lead on critical trade negotiations, such as the U.S.-Israeli Free Trade Agreement, and contentious trade issues such as steel. And you've started us well down the road toward more pension security for the American worker and a better trained, more adaptable American workforce. All of these are important accomplishments that will touch the lives of each of our fellow citizens. I don't think there can be a finer tribute to a public servant than that. Bill, you've helped change the debate from one of looking backward, arguing about 1930s dogma to one of looking forward. It's a wonderful contribution. The message of hope and opportunity that you've carried is what our administration and our party are all about. Finally, Bill, let me say something as the manager of a rather large bureaucracy myself. <laughs> it's one thing to identify the problem and bring it to everyone's attention but it's wholly a different animal to bring solutions to the table. And that's what you've done so many times for our country, for our administration, and for our party. That's a talent we value, and I'm going to miss your insight and wisdom. 
So good luck in your new challenge, and God bless you. And don't drop this, because it's made of glass. <laughs> accomplishment. I'm not sure that's quite true to say I never had more fun. I think uh, I had more fun as chairman of the party when we got you elected. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a joy to uh, be associated with people that you, you love and respect. I have uh, served under this president for, for seven years almost. And I have watched this country change in a fashion that uh, it rarely does in such a short period of time. Emotionally, economically, morally, ethically, substantively, and, and the things that count. And the, the thought that uh, all of us, most of us in this room have had any part of that is a source of enormous pride. We appreciate that. I certainly did. And I guess, Mr. President, that uh, the ultimate pride comes in um, the association you have with people that give so much. And the people in this room, the family, both of our families, my children, the, uh, my political children here. <laughs> <laughs> My friends, we have all labored in the vineyard in our, in our several ways. And I think we take a great sense of pride in, in having been a team that was a part of your team. And I thank you more than I can possibly say for that opportunity. And I thank those here for giving me the chance to work with all of you. God bless. Thank you very much. such a deficit. <laughs> Roosevelt's Nobel Peace Prize, which he won for ending the Russo-Japanese War. And I like to point out he did it in true Republican style. He was on a yacht. <laughs> 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 